We appreciate uh, your prayers and thoughts. I think most of you've heard by now that we had another run through with my son and his uh, possible transplant only to uh, have it yet again um, canceled at the last minute. So we're still in waiting. Um, but uh, we know that God has his plans and we're going to trust him Amen. that he will provide. But it's good to see you this morning. Let's bow our heads for just a word of prayer, okay? Father in heaven, as we, as we study this morning, we pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit to make these words effective, which they cannot be on their own. Uh, we just pray for your help and your blessing and that you will empower what I say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are getting ready to witness a phenomena. We are coming up to a celebration here in a few weeks that is almost universal. It's called Christmas. Now, for Christians, it's a time of remembering the birth of Christ uh, to save humanity. But other religions have come up with their own versions of it. Whatever it is and whatever it's called, it's clear that the Christian celebration of Christmas is uh, one of the underlying themes. Yes, it has become commercialized. Yes, uh, it is celebrated by those who don't acknowledge Christ in their lives. But the theme of Christianity seems to be indelibly etched into the basis of our culture. And you know something, when it comes to the task of communicating the love of God to the world around us, the celebration of Christmas gives us an advantage. Amen. It gives us an advantage. It's the time when people's hearts are softer and we can talk more about the love of God for us. And, and they just might be willing to listen a little bit more during this time. You know, it's interesting to note that in the gospel narratives of the life of Christ, it's only Matthew and Luke that give us any information about the birth of Christ. Now, you might be interested to notice that Matthew and Luke both begin with genealogies. Matthew, written to the Jews, Matthew is the gospel, the, the good news, written to the Jews by a Jew. Matthew was a Jew. Writing to the Jews, he takes the genealogy of Jesus all the way back to Abraham. The purpose of his genealogy was to prove that Jesus was a descendant of Abraham and the son of David. Luke was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. And his genealogy goes all the way back to Adam. The point of Luke's genealogy was that the good news is for everyone, Jew, Gentile, and everyone in between. Luke also includes something in his narrative that is not found in any of the other Gospels. And it comes in Luke chapter 2. So I thought I'd share that with you this morning. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. 
Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at these things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all of the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Now I think that if we were to look for the one characteristic that is supposed to mark the lives of the followers of Christ, it would be the joy, the joy that we have in this life. The angel said, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. The, the original language, the good tidings, is the good news. It's the gospel. The message that the angels brought was the good news of great joy to every person. So the question is, what happened to the joy? Where did, where did all the joy go? <laughs> Why is it that Christians sometimes can be such somber and serious individuals? Why is it that the followers of Jesus can be sometimes so joyless in their Christianity? You know, early in my walk with Christ, I had an experience that was really an important lesson to me. You know, when I first became a Christian at Union Springs Academy, I was a rather somber soul. You know, I took my faith very seriously. I mean, really, really seriously. I was always lamenting my sinfulness and my failings. And one day I walked into another guy's room at the dormitory at that school that I was at, and I said in rather mournful tones, I am so glad I am a Christian. And he turned around and looked at me and said, well, you sure don't look like you're very glad to be a Christian. You know, he says, I, I've seen a lot more joy out of people who had no religion. And, um, and I realized that he was right. I've come to the conclusion that there are two things that can rob us of the joy that we are supposed to have in Christ. And they are really opposite problems. The first one is we don't understand what the gift of life means to us. And the second is we don't understand just how much we are loved. A few years ago, I received an issue of a magazine called Leadership Magazine. Anybody familiar with that at all? Leadership Magazine. It's a, it's a journal for Christian leaders. It's published by Christianity Today. I had always had really great cartoons, and I think most of the, guy, most of the pastors that I knew that subscribed to the magazine loved it because of the, the religious cartoons that were in there, like the one that showed the two deacons standing there and there's you know a pile of dust and ashes on the floor in the foyer of the church and uh, and uh, a clerical collar sitting on top and somebody says boy that's the worst case of ministerial burnout I've ever seen in my life <laughs> but anyhow there was an article called the postmodern generation postmodernism is what came after the modern generation now that probably sounds like I'm stating just the obvious right <laughs> But for those of you that have been around for a while, you remember when the goal was to be modern. It was new and it was exciting to have a car that looked like it could actually fly to the moon, you know? And there were those cars that had the big fins, right? You know, my sister had a, a 57 uh, Plymouth uh, four-door that my father bought for her and she hated that car. It just, you know, you see, you know, Plymouth at the time thought if fins worked for Chevy, then really big fins would work for Plymouth, you know. So they had these big fins on this car that was just like something that looked like it came out of um, the original, um, you know, the, the original sci-fi movies or something, but it had huge fins. Now, we, we were always striving for modern, for the modern. Scientific discovery was critical to the development of our society. But scientific discovery had an unexpected effect on the way people thought. Things that had been seen as absolutes in society, in the light of scientific research, didn't appear to be so absolute. Technology was quickly changing established values. And the idea that there are truths that apply to everyone was coming into question. The postmodern generation is suspicious of absolutes. 
Now, the article that I read in Leadership says that one of the issues affecting the postmodern generation is that for so long, parents wanted to instill a, a sense of self-worth and positive self-image in their children, and they have succeeded so well that those same children hardly understand why they need a savior. They don't feel lost. They don't struggle a whole lot with guilt. They have been handed, in some cases, an attitude of entitlement that they have a right to the good things of life. Now listen, I'm no expert on how to raise emotionally health, healthy children. But I know that destroying our children's sense of self-worth and self-esteem is not going to achieve for them what we want it to achieve. Shaming our children into compliance ultimately is destructive to what we're trying to achieve. But there are absolute truths. There are some things that are absolute. And here are some that I have found, that I have thought a lot about. There's three of them. First one is, everyone wants to live. Unless there's something wrong with us, we reach out for life, we fight for life, we strive to protect life. Life has value. That's principle number one. The second principle is this. We want to be loved. From the moment we're born, we need to be loved and cared for. Do you remember that first time you held your baby in your arms and that baby looked at you and looked into your eyes with some kind of recognition? There was a question in that look. The question was, do you love me? And am I safe in your arms? And even when that search for love has been damaged, the natural tendency of the child will be to reach out searching for that love. And that's the reason why a child savagely beaten by their father will reach out to be picked up by that same father when he shows up at the hospital later on. Love is the universal hunger of every beating human heart. And the third one is this. The third is an undeniable universal truth. And that is that death stalks every one of us. Everyone reaches for life. We strive for life. We fight to live. But death will ultimately claim every one of us. Now, when you're young, you have this sense of immortality. You cannot conceptualize death. It affects old people. It won't affect me. And when someone close to you dies, it rocks your world. I was 12 years old when word came that my best friend had been killed in an automobile accident. And I had the hardest time trying to understand what had changed. One minute he was there, and the next minute he wasn't. And it was something that I grappled with and struggled with for quite a while. I believe that that sense of immortality that young people have is a legacy of Eden. We come into life fully expecting to just go on forever. And when something tragic happens and a young life is cut short, it takes us all by surprise. From the moment of birth, death stalks every moment, and yet we are surprised when it finally strikes. It betrays the fact that it is hardwired in us to live. Death is an intruder. But if life lasts long enough, if time lasts long enough, it will claim everyone in here today. I've always thought, and I've said it before, that I believe that one of our greatest assets is our belief in the understanding of the great controversy, the struggle between good and evil. When tragedy strikes, when something bad happens, when death rears its ugly head, we can say with a biblical authority that this is not what our Creator had in mind for us. This isn't the way it was supposed to be. He made us to experience life. Death was not a part of his plan. But the Creator gave his children the freedom to choose. They were warned as to the consequences of disobedience. But love cannot be compelled. It cannot be forced. They had to choose, <coughs> willingly choose, the freedom to obey and disobey. The <coughs> they were given the freedom to make that choice. The consequences were spelled out. Disregarding God's instructions would bring death. Obedience would bring life. Their decision is what 
brought death into the human race. I have believed that you can draw a straight line from the Garden of Eden to my friend Steve that died in an automobile accident. And when Adam and Eve sinned, a watching universe watched in stunned silence to see what the Creator was going to do with this problem. Listen to these words from the book Patriarchs and Prophets. Oh, we had them. Is it still off? Have you got it? The fall of man filled all of heaven with sorrow. The world that God had made was blighted with the curse of sin and inhabited by beings doomed to misery and death. There appeared no escape for those who had transgressed the law. Angels ceased their songs of praise. Throughout the heavenly courts, there was mourning for the ruin that sin had wrought. The Son of God, heaven's glorious commander, was touched with, with pity for the fallen race. His heart was moved with infinite compassion as the woes of the lost world rose up before him. But divine love had conceived a plan whereby man might be redeemed. The broken law of God demanded the life of the sinner. In all the universe, there was but one who could, in behalf of man, satisfy its claims. Since the divine law is as sacred as God himself, only one equal with God could make atonement for its transgression. None but Christ could redeem fallen man from the curse of the law and bring him again into harmony with heaven. Christ would take upon himself the guilt and shame of sin, sin so offensive to a holy God that it must separate the Father and his Son. Christ would reach to the depths of misery to rescue the ruined race. It goes on to tell us that when the plan of salvation was finally revealed to the heavenly hosts, that they were overwhelmed by grief. Many of the angels offered themselves to pay the price for the sin of the human race, but an angel's life could not pay the price for sin. Only one equal to God could pay the debt. The father surrendered his son to the human race. The angels would have to watch their beloved commander make his way to the cross. The angels would, would watch him be tormented and tortured. They would have to watch him die an agonizing death to pay the guilt of humanity's sin. And they would not be able to come to the defense of their Lord. But when they were shown the multitude that, that no one could number that would be redeemed by that terrible sacrifice, they broke into praise at the plan of God for the salvation of a lost race. And it says again in Patriarchs and Prophets, then joy inexpressible joy filled heaven. The glory and the blessedness of a world redeemed outmeasured even the anguish and sacrifice of the Prince of Life. Through the celestial courts echoed the first strains of that song which was to ring out above the hills of Bethlehem. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. With a deeper gladness now than in the rapture of the new creation, the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. In the fields that night, when the shepherds were tending their sheep, they had no idea that not far from where they were, the redemption of the human race was being worked out. A baby was born that would bear the weight of sin on his shoulders. It was a baby born for one purpose, and that was to die as a sacrifice for the guilt of the human race. I believe that if we truly understood that connection between the baby's birth and ourselves, we would spend every day rejoicing and praising our Creator. Amen. Here's what I know. From the moment Adam and Eve sinned, the human race deserved death. They didn't deserve to draw another breath. If that is so, then I don't deserve to be here. I didn't deserve to draw even my first breath. It is an act of the mercy of God that any of us are here at all. When I truly understand that point, then I begin to understand why every day is a gift. Every day of life is a reason for joy. Hebrews 2, 14 says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives 
were held in slavery by their fear of death. Do you remember that I said three things? First of all, everyone wants to live. That's what we were made for, was life. Second, that we want to be loved. And third, that death stalks us from the day of birth on. The good news of great joy to all people is that Christ came to restore us back to what he designed us for. He came to restore us to life, not just for a few short years, but for eternity. He designed us for life lived abundantly. And in John 10, verse 10, it says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Heaven waits for us. Heaven waits with all of its joys, with all of its discoveries. Eternity is ahead. Remember that I said that we all want to be loved. <laughs> Through ceaseless ages of eternity, we will live in absolute wonderment of a love that was willing to sacrifice everything for us. You know, one of the most amazing statements in that book, Patriarchs and Prophets, is this one that simply says this. It says, oh, the mystery of redemption, the love of God for a world that did not love him. Who can know the depths of that love which passes knowledge? Through endless ages, immortal minds seeking to comprehend the mystery of that incomprehensible love will wonder and adore. And one day, that horrid intruder called death will be destroyed. Revelation says that there will be no more death that there will be no more sorrow or crying. Death and he who has the power of death, the devil, will be destroyed forever. Amen. From that moment, from the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, our world has existed as an open sore, an open bleeding sore in the universe. That baby born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago is the only hope of humanity. It's the only hope that we have. And he will bring this to an end. Death and sorrow and crying will not be allowed to continue. And so, in the face of tragedy, in the face of sorrow, there are reasons for joy. In Christ is the answer to the need of every human heart. He is our life. He is our, our joy. And he is the destroyer of our, destroyer of our old enemy, death. Satan has let, had his run. He had has his glee over the sufferings he has caused, but it will be over soon. Jesus will come, and the devil will be brought to his knees before the creator of all things. Even in the face of tragedy, with the tears still wet on our faces, we can rejoice that Jesus has come and has conquered death and is coming again. We're privileged to have my sister-in-law, Dale, Sandy's sister, with us. This, and this morning, I showed her a picture in my study that I'm proud of. It's me baptizing a woman by the name of Liz. Liz has, has her head shaved, and, and it was kind of a funny thing. I ran into her, I met her, don't even remember how I met her. Um, she showed up at church, I think, with her grandkids one Sabbath, and uh, we got to talking, and then I got to studying with her a little bit. and. Um, and we had had, we were having an evangelistic series there. Uh, we were kind of towards the end of it when she showed up. And, um, and uh, you know, she, she um, I, we realized that there was a problem. And that was that Liz was fighting brain cancer. And um, she had been treated. She had gone through chemotherapy and radiation and the whole business. And, and, um, and things were not looking good and we knew that this was going to end very shortly and so the sabbath we had the baptism i had told her liz i want you to be a part of that baptism well she didn't quite understand it and so she showed up um you know towards the end of the baptism on that sabbath morning and she looked and she was sitting next to somebody she turned to them and said oh i wish so much i could do i wish i could be a part of that you know and uh, so when I finally saw her, I thought she was going to come back. We were going to go ahead and baptize her. When I saw her, I said, Liz, I, I thought you were coming back. And she says, oh, I wasn't sure that I could. And I said, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely no problem whatsoever. And I had told the deacons, don't empty that baptistry because there's one more person. I don't know where she is, but there's one more person that I've got to find. 
And so when we finally found her, everybody was in the fellowship hall for a potluck, and I went out there and I announced, we're all going back into the sanctuary. And so everybody came back in, and I baptized Liz. And the picture that I have of her is coming up out of the water with this look, the smile on her face was just priceless. Just priceless. And a month later, I did her funeral service for her. But Liz knew what her future was. She knew that because of Jesus, there was hope. That there was more beyond this. That whatever happened, her life was secure in Jesus. The birth of that child 2,000 years ago was our guarantee that this is not the end. That whatever happens now is not the end. That Jesus is coming back to take us home. And because of that birth of that baby, you and I have a hope that is more joyful than anything we could possibly imagine. There's a reason to rejoice in that hope, isn't there? Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the gift that you've given us in your son. So grateful for your love to us that you would sacrifice your son to save us. And Lord, we pray that you will fill our hearts and our minds with joy and peace. A joy that is, that is beyond our reach. A joy that fills us and fills this place and, and, and testifies to those around us of our love for Jesus, your son, and our trust in you. But today, dear Lord, we give ourselves to you again and ask that you will just fill our hearts with joy, that others will see the joy in us because of our love for you and our love for Jesus. Bless us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.